Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Basics of Agribusiness Planning. Uh, this webinar is to help our VISTA Native Food Sovereignty Fellows to understand the basics of agribusiness to include an overview of agricultural systems, economics and marketing, basic business planning and record keeping. Today's presentation is really intended to provide a broad overview of basic agribusiness principles. Uh, some of the principles may not seem like they apply directly to your service, but think about how they may apply to the operations at your host site. If you find some of the principles to be applicable, then please visit the resource websites that we're going to have listed at the end of the presentation for more information. Uh, you can download a copy of today's slide deck in the handout section of your control panel, or you can always just contact me and I can email you a copy. We'll also be taking questions at the end of the webinar, uh, and you can do that by just, uh, if you see the questions uh, section in your control panel, you can just type your question in and just send it. Uh, it's, it's similar to uh, like a text message. Uh, and then also I'll just remind everyone that we do have another webinar scheduled uh, for this coming Monday, and that's going to be the second part of our uh, conducting a food sovereignty assessment series. Uh, and that's going to be next Monday at 2 p.m. Central. And I sent out an email this morning that has the, the link to that. So I would uh, uh, go back and check your inbox and uh, please register uh, for that webinar as well. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce to today's presenter, uh, Dr. H.L. Goodwin. Dr. Goodwin is a professor and poultry economist at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, a senior economist and food safety director at the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, and the director of student networking and curriculum enhancement for the Bumpers College. He joined the faculty of the University of Arkansas's Center of Excellence for Poultry Science in Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness in December of 1997. Prior to joining the university, he was the Agricultural and Food Systems Policy Advisor to the Minister of Agriculture in Slovakia and a Fulbright Scholar in Czechoslovakia. He was faculty at Texas A&M's Department of Agricultural Economics and served as the Associate Director of the Texas Agriculture Market Research Center. He received his PhD in Agricultural Economics from Oklahoma State University in 1982. And with that, HL, the presentation is yours. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with our VISTA volunteers. Uh, there might be a little bit of racket in the background that you hear periodically. I'm traveling and uh, I'm in a, my accommodation, but the doors uh, in this particular part of the, the hotel we're in are a little bit, when, when they close, they're a little bit loud. So uh, if you hear background noise, that's what it is. Uh, what we're going to do is cover a lot of ground today. Uh, my hope for this is to get uh, people of diverse backgrounds uh, brought up to a similar speed of the detail of agribusiness planning. So without more uh, delay, I'll carry on with getting started here. Uh, Brian, do I have control of the mouse? Yes, you do. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm sorry. I went a little bit too far. So there you see the topics we'll cover, and Brian covered those very well in the introduction. But we're going to look at the full gamut of the agribusiness system so that we can know what agribusiness planning really involves. <clears throat> the first thing we're going to look at is the structure of agriculture to realize it's more than just food. Uh, it actually entails many uh, different criteria, and you can see here the different things that are involved in food, manufacturing, construction, health care, personal care products, transportation, sports, printing, education, entertainment, on and on and on. 
uh, about one uh, out of seven jobs in the United States is either directly or indirectly related to agriculture, although less than 2% are actually involved in agricultural production. The rest of those are in manufacturing and transportation of the food and the businesses that provide the inputs for food production and the actual wholesaling and retailing of the food. I've got to start off with a few pictorial representations. I think it's important to realize that one U.S. farm feeds about 165 people per year. Uh, it's, uh, and if we look at what's coming in the future, uh, the food production is going to have to grow about 70% for us to keep up with the population growth. So you can see there that uh, in uh, the food that's produced today, about 100 and 10 domestic residents are fed and about 55 uh, international residents are fed on uh, 2.1 million farms. Pretty amazing uh, increase in production. So what does the food system look like? The food system is made up of what we call the input and facilitating industries. Uh, and then all the middle part, and we'll break this down as we go through, but all the middle part is what I like to call the supply chain or the market chain. The producers, the assemblers, the processors and manufacturers, food wholesalers, food retailers, and then finally food consumers. And that's underpinned by the regulatory institutions that uh, manage food safety, that manage food quality, that manage uh, grades and standards, uh, that manage the uh, uh, financial institutions. So all of these things, uh, the regulatory uh, aspect is necessary to underpin our food system and make it uh, as efficient as it is. Let's take a look at the primary sectors of the food system. There are three primary sectors. The first one is, I just call the food sector, and I'll go through this in some detail. The second one is the production agriculture sector, and the third one is the agricultural input sector. So to get a better idea of where we'll be going in the presentation, let's investigate each of these briefly. What's comprised of the food sector? Well, it's food retailing, it's food service, uh, the, the uh, institutions, hospitals, cafeterias, uh, schools, all of these things are in the food service industry. And that food service industry provides food not only for uh, those, uh, the manufacturers for those, but they provide for traditional restaurants, for fast food, and for this institutional food service. So a food service would be like Cisco Foods, someone who takes food, remanufactures it, and distributes it to these other outlets. Food wholesaling is part of food service. Many of you may have seen trucks like Ben E. Keith is big in the, in the Texas, Oklahoma area, and others. You may have seen uh, uh, wholesale distributors, particularly of meats and of fruits and vegetables. They're typically more involved in perishables, and uh, food wholesaling is usually done uh, within or by own companies for things like bakery products and these things. And then uh, uh, many times the food wholesaling for canned or frozen foods <clears throat> is done by a subset of a retail uh, food company. Then we have food manufacturing, canning, freezing, anything that deals with processing food and changing its form uh, and its shelf life and uh, actually formulating the different parts of a recipe to make a different food. And then transportation and storage, which is a large part of our food sector system. Production agriculture. What are some things we need to think about production agriculture? We need to think about farm size. 
uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, farms are getting uh, fewer and larger. This trend has been happening for many, many years. However, in the last two ag census, we've seen a swing of more farms, many of those from smaller farms that are from uh, new or beginning farmers or people retiring uh, and getting into the agricultural business on a smaller scale. Farm income, uh, farm, inc farm income this year is expected to decline uh, or this census is expected to decline from what it was in the last census. <clears throat> but a large part of this is decreasing commodity prices, uh, lower prices for cattle and hogs, and uh, obviously lower prices for grain and grain products. So the actual farm income uh, derived from farm products is decreasing, but the off-farm income that uh, brings that up or that plays a part in actual farm household income is expected to increase. You hear a lot about subsidies. Animal agriculture, with the exception of dairy, receives no subsidies from the government. I have here that they receive indirect subsidies, however, through the grains that the livestock eat. Uh, the big uh, receivers of agricultural subsidies are corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, cotton, and also peanuts. Uh, so these are, and rice. So these are the big ones. Uh, five of those six obviously are food products. Uh, but animal agriculture receives those subsidies indirectly through uh, lower prices, crop agriculture, direct subsidies, and then I've already mentioned the off-farm income. Typically, uh, about 64% of all farm households have off-farm income from one or both spouses that contribute to their total household income. And then farm ownership structure, <clears throat> we'll look a little bit at that, but uh, most farms, despite what you hear, are family owned. Uh, you may say, well, what about all the corporate farms? Most of the corporate farms are family corporations. And I think we have some information here in a minute that will explain some of that. And again, the, the farm size, one thing to think about is competing uses for land. And this is particularly a, an issue in what I'll call urban fringe or suburban areas. Areas, uh, agricultural land obviously is prime land for development. It's typically uh, flat, it has good drainage or it wouldn't be farmland. So these, uh, this also happens to be the, the type of land that's uh, excellent for building construction. So they're competing uses for land. And as the value of the land for uh, purposes other than food production increases, uh, it becomes more and more difficult for farmers to justify economically keeping their land uh, in agricultural production. What about the ag input sector? It's made up of manufacturing. What kind of manufacturing? Well, equipment manufacturing, agrochemicals, uh, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, uh, fungicides. Uh, I've got here genetics, and I'm not necessarily talking about uh, genetically modified organisms. I'm talking about the management of the hybridized seeds, the management of the bloodlines for the uh, animal production. Uh, so genetics is a big part of that. Uh, input distributors, this is particularly uh, a big issue for crop producers for their fertilizers and the different uh, agrochemicals that augment that, but also <clears throat> for fuel and uh, for livestock, it's a, it's a, big, uh, a big part of in, input distribution is for uh, animal feeds and also animal pharmaceuticals. The import, input distributors can be corporate or they can be cooperatives. Many, many uh, agriculturalists are involved in cooperatives where the producers uh, band together to uh, have buying power to be able to secure 
better prices for their inputs. And then the services and financing that we see, uh, custom labor, a lot of times there is custom uh, mechanized labor for uh, harvest and other things. And uh, there's also the marketing aspect. Some of you may be familiar with uh, futures markets, with marketing firms, uh, particularly in livestock companies or individuals that, that purchase large numbers of cattle and to group them and then uh, resell them or uh, manage them on behalf of feedlots or other enterprises where they're grouping these uh, animals together for, for better efficiency. And then obviously the financing for loans, there's local banks, there's uh, regional agricultural banks, there's the farm credit service banks, and also the farm service agency banks, all of which are sources of financing for agribusiness. So what about farmers expenses? Uh, farms, no different than your household. Everybody's expenses continue to rise. And here is uh, an example of uh, the comparison of expenses from uh, 2006 to 2014. Uh, these have re leveled off somewhat, mainly because purchase feed and uh, fuels have leveled off, but uh, there's still, and also interest rates, but there's still a lot of uh, the farmer's expenses that continue to rise. So they face the same cost price squeeze that all of our households face. I mentioned a little bit ago about uh, the other services that go into the food system. Here's a picture of what we call the farm dollar. <clears throat> In uh, 2016, farmers received about 16% of every dollar uh, of food expenditures were attributable to the farm share. That's more obviously for something like table eggs where there are fewer services provided to the egg. It's washed, graded, and then packed and shipped. Uh, than it is for something like milk or uh, canned green beans where large percentages uh, of, uh, of the uh, food dollar are for off-farm services. And that's dropped to about 14% as of the last accounting uh, through the end of 2017. So that was a quick run through of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of the uh, agribusiness system. Now let's talk a little bit about risk. We need to understand risk uh, so that we can think appropriately about the marketing system and then we'll get to actual business planning. But these are all prerequisites that we, we need to understand the parts of the, of the ag system uh, the role of risk and also the marketing so that we can uh, do an appropriate job of agribusiness planning. So let's first define risk. There's a definition of risk. A risk is something that you can assign a probability to. A lot of people say, well, the weather is uncertain. No, the weather is risky. How do we, how can we say that? Because we can know from uh, 50 years of, of data, uh, daily temperature and rainfall data, what the probability is of a certain uh, range of temperatures and the probability of a certain level of rainfall based on 50 years of information. Uh, so it's not uncertain, it's risky. Risk is anything uh, that you can assign a probability to. And because you can assign a probability to it, uh, whether it's external or internal vulnerability, you can protect and plan around that. So it's a very important thing to think about. Uh, things that are uncertain would be, well, we'll get to that in a minute. I, I won't jump in there yet. So what are some basic categories of, of risk, financial risk? And I'm just gonna put these up here one at a time. Food industry risk. 
primarily food safety risk. Many people take insurance out to protect them from risk or to plan for their risk. Uh, and crop insurance is a major thing that many uh, agricultural producers uh, look at. And there is data, actuarial tables, just like there is for life insurance, a lifespan, for car insurance, for accidents. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Any field that you can have a run of data about a negative occurrence happening, you can, you can calculate a probability and think of the uh, cost and uh, of that happening and come up with an insurance premium. Securities is a risk. This is up and down of the stock market, up and down of the commodity market. So we have this trading risk, and this is very technical, but there's systemic risk, which uh, you know you can go back and look at this later. I want us to get through a lot of a lot of the other material. And then there's non-systematic risk. System systemic risk is related to the market itself. Non-systemic is related to things that aren't impacted, that aren't directly related to the market. And then there's workplace risk. Uh, and that's a hazardous event or phenomena, worker safety, accidents on the job, et cetera, are all workplace risk. Here's what risk is not. It is not uncertainty. Now, what is uncertainty? It's where neither the probability or the mode of occurrence is known. A peril or hazard uh, that can make something, uh, makes occurrence of the peril more likely or severe. Those are uncertainties. What's a good example of this? Perhaps the world economic uh, system. We had, uh, we call it the financial crisis in, <clears throat> in the late 2000s, 2007 through 2010. And we look at that and we say that was uncertainty. Uh, government policy is uncertainty. We have no clue. Uh, really what policies may be in this country and certainly not in other countries. There's a reference if you want to read more about risk and these are references are scattered throughout here and I put some at the end of most of the sections as well. What about risk tolerance? The way you choose to manage your risk and understand the choices that you have and consider each one of them is uh, indicates your uh, risk tolerance. Those of you who don't buy insurance probably have a pretty high risk tolerance. Either that or the value of whatever you might lose is so low that it doesn't make sense to insure it. I remember I had a 1963 GMC pickup a few years back and uh, I quit carrying anything but liability insurance because if I had uh, wrecked the car on my, of my own fault, in a single car accident, uh, the insurance premium is worth more than the vehicle, so I didn't insure it. You can handle risk in five ways. One, you can retain the risk yourself, which is what I just explained with my old pickup. I took on the risk and the cost of a, a negative occurrence myself. Or you can shift the risk. How do you shift risk? You can either shift it to someone else through a contract, or you can shift it through buying insurance. You can reduce risk by diversifying or by having improved technology or improved management practices that would reduce risk. You can self-insure. That would be something that uh, a lot of people could do if they could afford it, but most people can't. Uh, if you have a, a vehicle and uh, you want to self-insure, what that would mean is you put money back so that in case something adverse happens, you can pay for it yourself without relying on an insurance company. And then you can avoid, avoid risk completely. And for farmers, this would be sell your land and put your money in a government uh, bond or a tax-free municipal bond. Don't worry about any of the risk associated with agricultural production. Just take your 3% tax-free uh, return and forget about it and go to the house.
Now, so we covered how you might handle risk, but there are five basic types of risk in agriculture. And I'm going to go through each one of those uh, in some detail so you can get an idea about what I mean when I talk about risk. The first type of risk is production risk. Then we have marketing risk, financial risk, legal risk, and human resource risk. So let's let's step through each one of these. And I'm suspecting uh, that I have them from uh, uh, easiest to think about to the most difficult to think about here in order. Usually we can figure out production risk, marketing risk, financial risk. Uh, but then when we get into legal and human resources, it gets a little fuzzy. So let's look at production risk. <clears throat> There's a simple definition of production risk. Any variability in outcome that poses risk to achieving the financial goal of the producer is a production risk. What are some major sources of production risk? The one we all think of, weather. It's the first one everyone thinks of. Pests, uh, aphids, if you're dealing with wheat and you have a warm winter, uh, cutworms, uh, grasshoppers, army worms, uh, an outbreak of, of flies or lice or some other pest, uh, diseases. And this is typically uh, thought of more in livestock, but there are some very damaging uh, plant diseases that can come in, uh, like soybean rust, that can be devastating. Uh, tobacco mosaic virus is another one on, on crops. Uh, so uh, diseases are another uh, source of production risk. Uh, technology, why would I put technology down as a production risk? because when you have new technology, many times the management of that technology is unknown or you don't quite know what you're going to do with it and you can make errors, therefore contributing to production risk. The genetics uh, is a source of production risk. I'll give you an example. Uh, about uh, 20 years ago, a very large uh, poultry genetics firm had a fantastic uh, breakthrough in uh, a certain line of chickens that they had. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't make sure that the uh, male bird was uh, immune to something called a J virus, and about a third of the production was wiped out uh, in that particular breed. That company is no longer in existence, so that's an example of a genetic risk that was not properly managed. Input quality is another production risk. The fertilizer you buy, uh, the pesticides you buy, the feed you buy, any input that you buy, the fuel you buy, you need to make certain that the quality of the input is uh, sufficiently stable and of high enough uh, level to make certain that your efforts in production are not damaged by low quality inputs and efficiency of machinery is another one. Uh, it used to be that um, much of the harvests were lost because of uh, machinery inefficiency, but now we have a much better situation, even to the point of having uh, drones that scout fields for economic threshold uh, insect infestations. In other words, if uh, 50, uh, particular insects per hundred square meters uh, would begin damaging the yield of a crop. That's called an economic threshold. And these drones can use infrared imaging uh, and detect when this occurs and you can go in and spray. The old way to do it was field scouting where you hire people and they go out and look for bugs. Uh, I've done that. Uh, and uh, I would say that that drones are, are a definite advancement. If you've ever done field scouting uh, in some of these hot, uh, steamy days in the South, uh, you certainly would rather be running a drone. Uh, 
than doing it yourself. What are some ways you can manage production risk? Enterprise diversification, combinations of different crops and livestock. Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Off-farm employment, obviously, is a way to diversify. Uh, my dad used to uh, tell my mom he had to keep her working in town so he could afford to farm. So uh, many of you may have seen similar situations. Risk is reduced when income from one enterprise offsets low income from another enterprise. That's why you diversify. If you have all one crop, it could be a boom or a bust. Uh, you can make a great lot of money or no money, depending on the outcome. You're, you're better to diversify. Crop insurance is a way of passing risk uh, to your insurer. It's very detailed. I'm not going to go into crop insurance, but essentially you pay a premium, uh, a, a price premium or a, a fee for uh, the insurance company to take on your risk and it protects you against losses either due to production losses or price losses. And it offers you a way to even out uh, your income. Uh, yes, the premium would be considered a production cost, but if you can level out your income over time uh, by avoiding great losses, that will probably keep you operating much longer than those who don't have insurance. Uh, so it keeps your cash flow level and it allows you some flexibility in how you market your product. And I, I would say uh, crop insurance is primarily for crops, but remember that uh, forage for hay and pasture are also crops and there are crop insurance uh, products uh, that are tied to forage conditions and that are tied to rainfall levels uh, and you can check with a uh, farm service agency and find out what these are or with your uh, uh, extension agent or uh, someone uh, in in your uh, maybe in farm bureau or some farm union some other farmers organization about those things. Okay, what are some other production risk tools? Contract production. Uh, some of you that uh, have the ability to contract your production to processors. Uh, for instance, a lot of people grow barley for brewers, some people grow potatoes for potato chip companies, they grow tomatoes uh, for ketchup and processing, uh, tomato processing companies, they grow chickens uh, on uh, contract production for poultry processing companies. So contract production is one way. Vertical integration, production contracts between producers and agribusiness firms. Also, contracts can give you a price guarantee. You could forward contract uh, for a certain price. Uh, and knowing that if the price goes up, whoever bought the, the product from you gets that gain, and if the price goes down, uh, they suffer the loss. So obviously, they're not going to give you a, a contract production that ensures that, uh, that you'll be better off than they are, or they won't be in business very long. <clears throat> you would expect them taking up this extra amount of risk will come at a price, and it will, but also know that the downside of price drops will be lessened for a producer. When you do contract uh, production, I've just uh, explained this, the loss of flexibility and opportunities for uh, profit will be forfeited to whoever you contract with. New technologies are a production risk tool, varietal selections, genetically altered seeds, precision farming. All these techniques are ways of managing production risk. It can lead to lower input costs. Uh, if you have uh, Varieties that are resistant to certain diseases uh, that could eliminate spraying or other costs that you that you wouldn't have. 
This also can enhance environmental quality. The carbon footprint of agriculture has dropped dramatically uh, in the last uh, 18 to 20 years, and it's because uh, the technologies have allowed agriculturalists to be more precise with their applications, to use less uh, cultivation, to use less tillage, to use uh, lower amounts of irrigation water. So the environmental quality has been positively impacted by this technology. Uh, air quality is another thing. We've uh, uh, there have been a lot of, of increases in efficiency, for example, with aerial spraying, uh, with reductions in uh, carbon emissions from uh, tillage and tractor usage, chemical drift. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the drones. Uh, they're even now in uh, high value production, they're even using drones to spray with rather than crop, uh, than airplanes and crop. Uh, traditional crop dusters or boom sprayers so uh, they can get those drones can get right down almost on the crop and virtually eliminate chemical drift uh, this generally uh, these technologies mean higher crop yields and more cost effective use of the inputs for your crop in per, through precision application now let's move to marketing risk Marketing is the link between production and financial profit. So this is a big deal. Many, many farmers go into farming to produce, and they may be wonderful agronomists or wonderful animal husbandrymen, a wonderful horticulturalist, but they may not make the money uh, that they need to make to stay viable. And it's typically a problem with marketing. Uh, marketing risk happens when changes in weather or policy affect prices. And you can manage this with a well informed and balanced marketing skill set. And so let's look at what some of these things are. It all begins with a plan. Uh, you've heard the phrase perhaps a failure to plan is planning to fail. So you have to have a plan. And the first thing in your marketing plan. And the first thing in your business plan, and I'll go into this when we get to the business plan section, are personal considerations of your individual operation. Know the level of risk you're comfortable with. If you like to play it close to the vest and you don't like risk, you'll have a different strategy than someone who likes to take more risk. Be willing to stay current and learn new things and increase your skill set. Uh, knowledge is power, information is power, and the more informed and the more knowledgeable you are, the better your skill set, the more able you will be to increase uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of your marketing plan. <clears throat> marketing decisions cannot be made in a vacuum. I'll repeat that, cannot be made in a vacuum. They have to be made dependent upon your whole operation, financial, legal, human resources, and production. It all works together. So unless you're going to be a wholesaler where you just buy product and sell it, you've got to include these other considerations. If you're a producer, it has to include your whole farm production. Develop a long-term marketing plan. What's long-term? Well, in agriculture, three to five years is long term. So develop that marketing plan. And you have to have specific goals and objectives of a business. There's a, a system called SMART objectives. Go goals should be, or objectives should be simple. They should be measurable. They should be attainable. They should be reliable. And they should be time-based. So if you're going to make an objective that can be accomplished, it must be those things. I plan to increase the level of profit on my farm by 5% over the next calendar year. If you think that's realistic, that would be an excellent, an example of a smart objective. It's simple, it's measurable, it's attainable, it's re <clears throat> reliable and it's uh, time sensitive.
long-term marketing plans have to consider supply and demand. Uh, there was a situation a few years ago where the supply of cattle got all out of kilter. You know, about every seven to nine years is a cattle cycle. About every three to four years is a hog cycle. And about every other year is a poultry cycle. And uh, when these things happen, prices are going to follow. It's a supply and demand phenomena. What happened, though, in the late uh, period of, of, of 2000 and the early 2010s was that supply and demand were all messed up. We had a financial crisis followed by a severe drought, and that really messed with the ability of people to purchase uh, meat in, in particular. So there was an excess supply because demand decreased. Then what happened? Then we had a terrible drought in the Corn Belt and in many, many other parts of the country. And so <clears throat> the supply of grains uh, shrunk so that feed prices were very high and uh, prices of livestock followed. So, uh, you know, you can make a marketing plan, uh, but you can't always foresee things like a drought. They need to consider prices received in the region. Don't make it so specific that it only uh, influences prices received in your individual county or on your individual operation. Storage is a way to impact your marketing risk. If, you if you're producing grain and you have on-farm storage, it's a way to uh, uh, take the risk of low prices at harvest out of the equation. You can store your grain for a few months until that price recovers. A cash sale is another way to deal with it. Uh, deferred payment contracts. This is a little more sophisticated and typically used by larger producers, but you can actually uh, defer payment of your contract to help people out a little bit. Uh, having a fixed price contract for deferred delivery, in other words, I will deliver my corn to you for $4.50 a bushel beginning in January. Uh, and so that deferred delivery uh, lets you accumulate uh, perhaps extra money from the, the uh, storage of your product on your own property. You can use a basis contract. This again is, is uh, pretty complicated uh, for the layman deals with futures contracts. I'm not going to go into this, but any of you that uh, may have an economics background or know someone that deals with agricultural commodities, uh, futures contracts are an effective way to manage your marketing risk. You can also set minimum price contracts uh, that you, would, you will not accept a price below a certain floor. And the government sort of uh, has this already in place uh, in its uh, uh, farm support program with loan prices. So if you're signed up for farm uh, programs, uh, by default, you have a minimum price contract already in place. What about financial risk? There's three basic components of financial risk. Cost and availability of debt capital. How much can you borrow money for? What's the interest rate and how much money can you borrow? Ability to meet cash flow needs in a timely manner. And I'm just going to say here, most people that struggle in any type of business, it's a cash flow problem. Uh, cash flow is the air that fuels the fire of profit. If you have no cash flow, uh, you can have a great production, you can have a great market, but if your cash flow is off, your fire will suffocate for lack of capital to keep it running between uh, periods of sales. And the ability to maintain and grow equity. Uh, can I at least keep my value of my equity constant and grow that over time? That's a component of financial risk. The classic example of a terrible uh, financial risk is purchase of an automobile. Uh, it, it decreases from the time you turn the key on until you sell the car. Uh, 
so that's a situation where uh, a vehicle, a truck, or pickup may allow you to maintain or grow equity in your operation, but don't think that uh, you're going to grow equity in your uh, vehicle. So what do we need here? Please focus on this. And, and farmers, I think, are the worst at this. I can say this because I've been, I grew up on a farm and I've worked with farmers my whole life. Well-maintained financial records are a must to be able to manage your financial risk. So what do you need? You need a balance sheet. You need a statement of owner's equity. You need an income statement. You need projected and actual cash flows. Why do you need this? Because you need to be able to respond to interest rate increases. Uh, and when you do this, you can actually lower the risk to lenders uh, if you use crop insurance. You're taking uncertainty out of it. <clears throat> so let's say you've been operating on or running with $50,000 of operating uh, capital from a bank loan every year, and all of a sudden interest rates uh, go up uh, from 5% to 7%, and the lender's looking at that saying, wow, can I, can I really uh, keep loaning this money? Uh, if you have crop insurance to protect you against losses, they're more likely to continue uh, to loan you money to operate. <clears throat> you have to have adequate liquidity to keep your cash flow going. We talked about that just a minute ago. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I skipped one there. Probably the most uh, important one. Controlling and meeting family living costs. Farmers notoriously underestimate the amount of money it takes to live, and, uh, and they have a hard time controlling that. Uh, so just be aware when you're working with a producer, if they say they can live on uh, $15,000 a year uh, or $40,000 or whatever it is, you can bet that they've underestimated it by a minimum of 10%, if not 20%. Why is this? Because there are always things that come up and you're not going to deny your family the ability to live uh, as you would want them to. So. Most people are uh, are not even uh, remotely close on their family living expense estimates. What about legal risk? I won't go into a lot of this. It's associated with everything and there are four basic categories of legal risk. I would say that you can contact the uh, Indigenous Food and Agricultural Initiative to get more assistance with with legal risk, most of the staff are lawyers and they should be able to, to uh, advise you on how to seek legal advice uh, locally to handle your problem. Uh, a big category is legal business structure, taxes, and estate planning. Uh, this is typically the weakest part of any farm operation, is their business structure formation and how they view taxes and the lack of having a state plan. Many producers, and you've probably heard it, well, I need to buy some new equipment or I'm going to have to pay taxes uh, this year. That's really not a good reason to buy new equipment. You may make a purchase that's inefficient for your operation and cost you money in the long run simply because you're trying to avoid paying income tax. Not a good plan. Uh, I've gotten into some pretty, uh, vigorous discussions with people before. Uh, many people do not like to pay taxes, but uh, sometimes it's a lot better to pay tax and to buy and make a capital purchase and buy something you don't really need just to keep from giving money away in taxes. Uh, have contractual arrangements. That's, a, that's the second biggest area of legal risk are your contractual arrangements. Uh, tort liability, can you get sued? plainly said, can you be sued? And then making sure you comply with statutory requirements. 
the regulations under which you operate, whether they be environmental or whatever, you must comply with your regulations. What are some legal risk tools? Create and operate under the proper business form. Have written contracts. If it's not written, it doesn't exist. Just use that for your work. If it's not written, it doesn't exist. So when you're dealing with somebody, have a written contract. Complying with your statutory mandates, you have to comply with the law. Whether it's tax reporting, uh, paying your bills, wage, hour, and safety requirements for workers or people uh, that are hands on your farm, even if they're family members or relatives that aren't employees. Uh, employee discrimination and termination. You have to be careful about your uh, legal responsibilities here. Uh, pesticide and herbicide application. Typically, it's required that you have a license to do that. If not, you have to hire a licensed applicator. Liability insurance is a must. Have liability insurance. I can't say that enough times. Have liability insurance. Both for tort and environmental accidents. So what about human resource risk? <clears throat> human resources are both a risk and a risk management tool. So uh, as, my, as my grandpa would say, that knife cuts both ways. Uh, they're risky, but it's a way to manage risk. The key is the approach you take to managing people. And not just employees, family members, probably more crucially, family members, neighbors, and relatives. How people are managed is the key to whether human resource risk is managed appropriately or managed in a way to cause you more problems than you already have. You need a clear definition of how plans and decisions are made in your firm. This is particularly true if you deal with any kind of food safety issues or any kind of environmental issues. How plans and decisions are made in your company are very, very important. It needs to be defined. It needs to be written down. So what are your resource risk tools? People management. Have job analysis and descriptions. If you hire people, have a job description and give them an annual evaluation and analysis of their job. Have a standard way you hire people. Give them an orientation and a training. And I'm, I must say, if you're dealing with anything under the animal, uh, the preventive controls for animal food or preventive controls for human food or the Food Safety Modernization Act, you must train your people that, that work in the production and handling of your crops and, and livestock. How you interact with your employees, what's the appropriate thing, what's their performance appraisal, how, do you, how are they paid, when are they paid, and you need to pre-think, oh, none of us like to think about, oh, I'm going to have to discipline a worker. Nobody likes to think about that, but it's something that you need to think about. And then the last point, and I would say, find a lawyer, figure out your estate plan. 65% uh, of all farms do not have an estate plan, uh, so they have no clue of what's going to happen when the major operator may pass or become incapacitated. Have an estate plan. So I've got a risk management checkup for you. I'm just going to put these up here, refer back to these uh, when you uh, load this off of uh, this system. There's some internet resources at the end of this section as well. So now let's talk a bit about marketing. And I'm going to go through this very quickly because we need to get to the agribusiness planning section. Consumers and producers have competing goals. Consumers want variety, low price, and maximum utility. Producers want specialization, high price, 
and maximum profit. So these two things are at odds. And how does it work? The role of the market system is to reconcile these differences between consumers and producers through the mechanism of price. So when you see a price, that's all it does. It's a communication mechanism between what is something worth to the producer and what is something worth to the consumer. And when they meet on that, that uh, agreement, uh, they'll have, you know, uh, uh, they'll have an agreement. The value of a product from producers view is the offer price. From a consumer's view, it's the bid price. How much will I bid for this product? When those things meet, you have a market clearing price. The, a, a transaction is, happens and that product comes off the market. So that's what price does for us. It's very, very important. So what are the pieces of the marketing system? There's the raw commodity or the producing, the, ag the assembly or the aggregating, taking grain to a grain elevator, taking cattle to a cattle auction, uh, taking milk to a milk processor. All those are aggregation functions. The processing or manufacturing, which is typically uh, something that's very easily understood by everyone. Wholesaling of manufactured products so that they can be warehoused and distributed to retailers, which is where the point of sale occurs. Remember, a restaurant is a retailer. It's not just a retail store. A commissary at, at a hospital uh, is a retailer. And airlines is a retailer. A hotel is a retailer. A ballpark or an athletic uh, event facility is a food retailer. And then, of course, there's the in consumer, uh, the consuming part of the market system. So there are things that we call utilities. And I'm going to mention these utilities, and I want you to think about them uh, as we go through here. And you can pick a product, uh, it can be wheat, it can be milk, it can be uh, tomatoes, it can be cattle, it can be anything, but think of a product and think about the utilities that the market system provides. There's the form utility, which is a change in physical condition. There's the time utility that extends useful life or shelf life. There's the place utility, that's distribution. How do you get it from one place to another? That's a utility the market system provides. The exchange uh, utility, ownership transfer, and the information activity, advertising and labeling, tells us things about products. So let's look at these utilities. Uh, and the functions of the market. There's an exchange function of the market, buying, selling. Uh, there's the physical functions that the market uh, provides transportation, storage, and processing, and then uh, also financing. Nothing in the market system happens without financing. And then there are the facilitating functions of market information, risk bearing, standardizing and grading. You know, our market system uh, is facilitated in large degree because there are grades for beef. If somebody goes to buy a choice steak, they know that it has marbling in it. If they go to buy a select, they know that it has less mar marbling in it. Uh, grade A eggs, uh, you know, uh, grade A fancy fruit versus grade A fruit that's not fancy. So all these things, have uh, standardized standardization and grading, and that provides market information. Now there's something called a marketing mix. This determines how a firm markets their production, and involves the characteristics of the product, uh, both nutritional and sensory. Does it taste good? Does it smell good? What are the nutritional facts in the food? How's it packaged? Uh, so those are product based. There's 
the price and of course we want to see market clearing price there's all kinds of ways people choose the strategies they choose they can choose break even pricing sell it for what it costs them to make there are pricing mechanisms called cost plus roundup at market penetration or skimming those are all detailed and their references at the end of the of this uh, powerpoint that can help you with that there's the promotion function, how you advertise and position your product. There's the place, where is it distrib distributed and what type of outlet is it in? Uh, is it distributed to warehouses and then sent out by company trucks to retailers? Or, or is it uh, sent to a Walmart distribution center and put in mixed loads and taken to some place like a Walmart store? And the people, who are the people to whom you're selling? This is your market segment, your target market segment. And that, uh, that is integral in this marketing mix in determining how to sell your product effectively. You look at socioeconomics and demographic factors. You also look at life cycle analysis. Are the people in empty nesters, are they senior citizens? Are they young uh, families? with double income and no children do they have children and the children under 18 etc cetera, etc cetera. so the life cycle the life cycle factor uh, to whom you're marketing is a big deal food consumption i have here type and quantity depend on a country's economy this also depends on a state's economy or a local community's economy You can have un or underdeveloped areas. You can have developing areas, or you can have developed areas. And what happens is the nutritional needs will be met first, and that's determined by income. Uh, but the nutritional needs go in this order, caloric requirements, protein requirements come next. Uh, then value added activities, for example, rather than buying uh, cream of wheat, they might buy Wheaties. Uh, that's a simplistic analysis, but cream of wheat takes much more uh, household investment in time than uh, a box of Wheaties cereal does, but the Wheaties uh, value added would require more income from the purchaser. What percentage of income does a household spend on food? It's about 10% in the US on average. It's, of course, it's higher for many people that have lower incomes, but on average, it's about 10%. Price comparisons of competing foods. This is the big area that we've had a lot of movement, particularly meats, it's easy to see. Uh, poultry, broiler meat uh, has gotten increasing market shares simply because uh, the price efficiency of poultry versus pork or beef, uh, you can buy a lot more for the same dollar. So uh, as there's a price squeeze or an income squeeze, people shift uh, to lower price meats, which in this case in our country is broilers. Comparisons of quality, type, and image additionally impact this. So here's a list of food consumer behavior, and I'm not going, I'm just going to flash these up, and the fonts get smaller as the impact decreases. So just think about that. Regional preferences for certain foods. Obviously, uh, in the Southwest U.S., you have a higher preference for spicy foods than you do in the upper Midwest. Food avail availability and technology. Ethnicity and culture education and socioeconomics you're down more now to what types of food people select from the foods that are available age and sex individual psychological and physiological makeup all add up to food choice what food will they choose Food buyer behavior is driven by consumer attitudes, by consumer motives, by their knowledge. 
their buying decisions and all these things that are particularly important if you're dealing with things like uh, uh, natural foods, slow foods, niche products, uh, maybe traditional foods for certain audiences, organic food uh, products, all these things are impacted by these food buyer behaviors. And it, and it impacts not only their initial purchases, but repeat purchases. Uh, if people try something and they're not satisfied with it, or they don't think they got good value, they probably will not be a repeat purchaser of that. So now we get back to the food system again. With this background that we've been uh, talking about, I hope you can see where the different pieces of the food system fit in uh, the entirety of preparing to do an agribusiness plan. Now, the last thing we need to talk about is how an agribusiness is managed. And so for a business to be successful, there are four management responsibilities that they have to be able to discharge appropriately, marketing and selling, financial management and planning, production and operation, and personnel or human resources. So these are the four primary uh, management responsibilities for any operator. So management is both an art and a science, and a manager has to be the person that provides the leadership and acts as a catalyst and communicator for change within an organization. The, the manager determines the personality of the firm, that's simply put. Uh, and the key management tasks are planning, organizing, directing, and controlling. And you can probably be thinking yourself right now, would I really be a good manager? Uh, I don't plan well, or I'm not very organized, or I don't like to direct people, or I don't, I don't like to feel like I'm in control and being responsible for things. But these are all things that can be learned and things that must be executed if you're going to be an effective manager. For instance, planning. You have to set a strategic long-term course of action with a mission and vision statement. You have to have goals for what you're doing. You have to have an action plan with specific objectives. And you'll see when we get to our business plan, how these things unfold. And you have to have tactical, tactical short-term courses of action as well. They need to be consistent with your strategy. There needs to be a how-to on accomplishing the strategic objectives with your tactics. Uh, tactics focus on implementation. And then there needs to be contingency planning. What happens if my plans blow up in my face? What happens if there's an unexpected, uh, an unknown or an uncertain event that occurs? How am I going to deal with it? You can't just wring your hands and say, wow, I wish that wouldn't have happened. You have to have a plan for mid-course adjustments. You have to be able to change your objectives due to different, different conditions. And uh, you have to be able to change your objectives due to strategic changes that these conditions may have forced upon you, even though they weren't something that you wanted. So in the planning process, sort of like the scientific method that uh, we've all been exposed to or inoculated with at one time or another in our education, gather the facts, analyze the facts, forecast the change, set goals and performance objectives, develop alternatives, and evaluate your results. So these are the things that have to be done in the planning process. What about organizing? This deals with your organizational structure. What jobs are to be done by whom? What's the chain of command? Who's in charge of the different 
uh, activities and who's in who's the authority and uh, who's responsible for different uh, things. And I, I've got the word bureaucracy in here. There have to there has to be certain bureaucracy. Obviously, this is simple if you're dealing with a sole proprietor or a, a small family. But uh, as businesses grow, there have to be relationships established within that organization to allow it to operate. The directing functions deal with selecting, allocating, and training personnel. How to staff uh, positions, who to put in certain positions. What are their duties and responsibilities? Uh, what are their uh, goals? What are their achievement objectives that uh, you expect? What results do you expect from that? Creating some kind of a desire for success in an incentive program hopefully positive incentives and giving them pride and seeing the job is done and done correctly and this typically flows from the leader uh, from you as a manager you will be the one that that uh, models uh, the type of uh, pride and and uh, effort toward doing a job correctly that would emulate that the, the uh, people working for you would emulate you have to have policies, procedures, and practices written down somewhere, uh, available for everyone, so that when there's an issue, you don't get in this emotional state of conflict, but you simply very calmly can go to the policies and procedures and practices that you've written down and that everyone's agreed to. What about the controlling function? This deals with monitoring and evaluating activities, uh, comparing your measurable objectives uh, that you set in your strategic plan with actual performance. Uh, what kind of tracking and reporting system are you going to use? You have to have something. Uh, that's the controlling function of the manager. Uh, you have to be able to generate information from data. You can keep all the data in the world if you don't have a plan to translate that into information that can be used to make decisions, you've wasted your time. Uh, it's complementary to all other management tasks and it compensates for judgment errors and unforeseen circumstances. So uh, this controlling function is huge. And again, policies, procedures, and practices. I'm going to uh, go, I'm going to skip through this here, uh, Brian, some of it's duplicative, and I'm going to go through this because we're going to be short on time. They can go back and, and see this uh, later, if I can page through it. I apologize for that. Okay, now we get to an overview of business planning. <clears throat> so I think we're all ready now to, to look at, we've, we've already talked about many, many of these pieces. So now we're going to assemble them in a rational process of business planning. So what do we hope to do here? Uh, help you all in, uh, understand the importance of creating a business plan define and describe the different pieces of it and provide some resources that can help you make a business plan. <clears throat> there are the specific objectives. So let's look at what is a business plan. And I, and I mentioned many times in here, the Small Business Administration, there's another excellent one called Ag Plan that the University of Minnesota has put together. But a business plan is a detailed outline of all the economic aspects that help are all the, the aspects that help you uh, achieve and maintain economic viability. It's a roadmap to improving the management, and there are the things that are included. And as I said, there's a resource here toward the end, but uh, it's a description of who you are, what you're doing, uh, how you do it, where you operate, how you're gonna make money, who your customers are, those types of things are in the business plan.
two purposes for a business plan. One, help the business management team make decisions to meet their specified goals and objectives. And two, sell the feasibility of the business to bankers and other investors when you need capital. Uh, I don't think one's more important than the other. They're equally important. Uh, if you can't get investors, uh, you can't start your business. And if you can't make decisions, your business won't last. So those two things are equal in importance. Here's a little more detail. I already went through that a little bit. Uh, again, the U.S. Small Business Administration. And you should answer these questions before starting your business plan. <clears throat> and while that's up there, <clears throat> let me make a statement. Please have a personal plan for yourself or a family plan. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means what do you as an individual or as a family want to accomplish and how can the business help you accomplish that? Too many people make a business plan without thinking about their personal plan and they get into the company and five years down the road, they have to make some decisions and they make them based on the business. And then in two years, they figure out they're miserable. They wish they'd never had a business. So upfront, think about how the business can support your family and personal goals, not the other way around. Because if you start working for your business instead of the business working for you, uh, maybe it won't be a sad, any more satisfying than if you worked for another individual for a paycheck. So here's some things to avoid in a business plan. Make sure you place reasonable limits on long-term and future projections. Uh, a few business plans correctly anticipate how much money and time will be required. They're overly optimistic and overconfident. And uh, many times they use sophisticated and complicated language. Stick with short-term objectives uh, and uh, develop the plan as your business progresses. Be conservative, uh, underestimate, be conservative. Write down your strategies uh, in the uh, in event of a, of a uh, business adversity and make your business plan simple because you need to be able to communicate it to others. Here's something on business planning that's very important. Uh, I've got the reference there at the bottom. You see, if you're dealing with someone that does not have a farm number, first thing you need to do is go to Farm Services Agency and get a farm number because you can't do anything without a farm number. You can't file, uh, file a, uh, a conservation plan. You can't participate in government programs. You can't uh, get government assistance with loans or uh, interest buy downs or anything else. So uh, there's a good resource, business planning resource right here. Here are your components of the business plan. Table of contents, don't forget this. It brings organization to your plan, it helps uh, highlight your key sections and it assists who's ever looking at the plan, which is probably going to be your lender, uh, to locate specific things. Anytime you can make it easier for them, uh, they tend to be in a better mood and they're more likely to work with you. What's the executive summary? Uh, one to two pages, it's the last thing you do and it shows the highlights of your plan, why you're doing what you do, who you are, and uh, what you're doing and what the financial result is going to be. Very short, one to two pages. This is what a lender or an investor will read. If they like it and they believe in it, they'll give uh, the detailed plan to one of their staff people to go over and assess to see whether you're a good credit risk. These are important pieces to help you define who who your company uh, 
uh, is and what it's going to be. Um, to do your business goals and objectives and to figure out a business profile. The act of writing these things down and, and Ag Plan, uh, I'll mention it again, is very good at leading you through this, but uh, I'd encourage each of you to get on Ag Plan and develop a, a mock uh, business plan because it will help you understand very uh, thoroughly why these things have to be written down and the importance of having them specifically delineated. Thorough description of your market, industry outlook, industry analysis, who's in the industry, what are the market trends, what's the market growth, uh, who's your descriptive or who are your customers and what are their needs, how are you going to satisfy their business needs. And then once you've done all that, you can highlight your competitive position within your industry and describe how you're going to be successful in it. But you have to be thorough in analyzing uh, the industry you're entering. Description of services or products. This is important. And again, I say all this stuff is important, but it doesn't have to be lengthy. We're not writing a, a, a 200 page novel here. Heaven forbid, it needs to be short and to the point, but it needs to be precise and thorough. Describe what you're selling, uh, what your pricing strategy, you're gonna price at the market, uh, are you going to insure yourself 20% profit, how are you gonna do that? How do you know your product or service is competitive? And here, focus on the benefits to the consumer. It will only be purchased if it provides benefits to someone. Providing a benefit to you is of no interest to the people buying your product. It has to be customer focused, customer centered. What are the different characteristics of your product that can be translated into a direct benefit to the person who buys it? Here's the organization and management that we just talked about. How's the company organized? Who's in charge of what? what How is it going to get done? Uh, do you have management and personnel resources necessary to run your business? You're going to hire somebody to do it. You're going to get your Uncle John to help you with it. What? Uh, I mean, you have to have a plan on how to execute. Uh, no bank is going to, or any other lender, is going to finance your operation if you don't have an execution plan. Uh, communicate that business has a sound production management and include the biographies of key people in the business. If it's uh, you and your spouse and uh, one of your siblings, communicate why uh, the three of you are excellently positioned uh, to, to pull this off and enlist the management responsibilities of your managers. Here's the marketing plan. We went through marketing in some detail earlier. You can go back and pull these pieces together. What are you marketing? How will your product be marketed? When will you market your product? To whom will you sell your products? And it also talks about uh, in the broader market regarding your products and your competitors and how that will impact your business. So you see these are this business planning are, is pulling together the things we've talked about today uh, in a very succinct manner. Uh, there's a reference in the end uh, to this McCorkle and Beavers article. Uh, any of this planning strategy, we've already talked about this, uh, but it's, it's important to recap the different things that you'll be covering in your marketing plan and sales strategies. Uh, if you're creating new customers, build relationship with your customers. Be different and stand out from the competition. People have to have a reason to buy from you. Offer goods and services people want at the best place, time, and in the right quantities. That overcomes a lot of uh, uh, people who just want to, to go out and uh, look at the lower price and establish a fair and competitive price. I had someone with a very large company one time said, you know, uh, there are three, three factors 
that people sell on product quality, product service, and price. And he said, you should never lose a customer because of your quality or your service. You should only lose customers based on price. And, and they told me, it said, you know, somebody's always going to be able to undercut your price. You have to give the buyer of your product enough value in non price related characteristics to keep them as your customer. There are, are the uh, marketing strategy that we talked about, the four P's of marketing, promotion, place, uh, production, price, and don't forget people, that's your, your top uh, category there. How do you do the financial management in your business plan? You communicate solvency through your balance sheet or net worth, profitability through your income statement, and liquidity through your cash flow plan. And be very detailed in all the assumptions that go into your financial projections. Uh, you want people that are evaluating your business plan to be able to track what you're actually doing and how you got to the numbers uh, that you used. Uh, here's just some uh, references back to the uh, uh, Small Business Administration, reviewing the financial management things. Uh, so they're in here grouped in the business planning section, so you can refer back to them. There's your uh, income statement and uh, your cash flow statement. That's the money on hand and incoming cash and current expenses. There's a draft of a business template. Small Business Administration has one. Uh, that's very good. I like uh, the ag plan that was referenced earlier in this webinar. So again, have an executive summary. Be concise and to the point. Have it reviewed by someone that has experience and that you trust and that will tell you the truth. Uh, you don't want to give it to somebody that's just going to agree with you because they want to make you feel good. Don't give it to Aunt Susie to review uh, or, or, you know, somebody like that. Uh, give it to somebody who's going to be tough and who's going to look at things like a banker would look. Communicate clearly what you do, how you do it, and why you do it. Uh, Distribute copies to everybody involved in your business. Review the plan periodically and monitor your progress. Keep records, please keep records. Compare your actual outcomes to your projected outcomes and change the plan as needed. Look, you're, you're not writing the Ten Commandments here or the Magna Carta. You're writing a plan uh, for your business. And if you need to change your plan, you need to change your plan, but have a method evaluate it, monitor your progress, and make it written and uh, rational. Here are some references. Uh, again, at the end, there are three or four slides of some excellent information uh, that you can refer back to. Uh, so, uh, Brian, i tell you what, we covered a lot of territory and uh, yeah. the way I look at it, we covered it in 86 minutes. I don't know. I was keeping time. <laughs> it's exactly 3.30, and I'm ready for questions if anybody is not mind numb and can still ask questions. <laughs> All right. Thanks, HL. Uh, so, yeah, uh, everyone who's on the webinar, uh, now's a good time to wake up and uh, <laughs> think about <laughs> Uh, think about what uh, what you've digested here. Um, think about uh, how it might apply to your service, how it might apply to an operation uh, at your site. Um, if you have any questions, um, now is a good time to ask them. And I'm just going to take a, a kind of a personal aside here and ask uh, – HL, HL, how long have you been teaching this kind of material? Uh, I have been involved in education either through uh, FFA or vocational agriculture or as an agricultural economist for the last uh, 41 years. 
41 years. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you are literally hours from retirement. That is correct. Uh, well, actually, days. Uh, I retire at 4.30 on June 29th. Not that I'm counting. All right. Well, on behalf of our AmeriCorps VISTA Native Food Sovereignty Fellows, we want to congratulate you on a, on a career uh, and on your retirement, and we wish you the best. Uh, and I also want to thank you personally uh, for providing this lesson today for our VISTAs uh, and making yourself accessible with your 41 years of knowledge uh, in, this, in this arena. Um, thank you very much, Brian. And, and I will just add, any of you that think of questions later, Brian will be able to answer everything you ask about this topic, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I, <laughs> I have learned everything through osmosis just being in your presence. So uh, uh, I can answer any, anything, uh, and if I can't answer anything, then I have HL's phone number, and uh, he can answer it. <laughs> That's right. I'm not going away. I'm just uh, right. not. Uh, I'm not going to have my time directed by others. I'll I'll use it uh, right as I see fit to dispose of it. I will say uh, for you Vista uh, volunteers that are on uh, this webinar, I am so uh, thankful that people like yourselves give of themselves to go and work with others and really, uh, you know life is about bringing others along with you and if we can all grow and, and uh, join hands and and pull each other along i think uh, the world would be a lot better place so thank you so much for your service and brian for you coordinating uh, these excellent people i've heard feedback on three or four of you i won't mention who they are but it, it's all been uh, uh, very laudatory and you're held in very high regard and appreciated uh, a great deal Absolutely. Well, thank you for the kind words. And um, I do have a question that has come through. Okay. And it is, has hemp been on the market long enough, again, to write a predictive business plan? My response to that would be no, it has not. And, and here's why. Uh, the uh, legislation uh, is still in flux in some states. Uh, I know, for example, in Kentucky and South Dakota, industrial hemp uh, is of there's a viable market in those products. There are many byproducts: the hemp oil, the hemp meal, which is very high in protein. Uh, the fiber, which has many, many applications. In fact, many of you may not know this, but Brian, if I'm not mistaken, the Declaration of Independence was written on hemp paper. I believe that's uh, right. And, and there are a certain uh, legislative acts that require certain documents still to be printed on hemp paper. So I think that's fascinating. But uh, depending on what happens with the uh, farm bill, uh, with industrial hemp, and, and whether that is as a blanket, uh, declassified and decoupled uh, from hemp that has uh, uh, medical and recreational properties uh, will depend on whether or not uh, a viable business plan can be uh, put together. I will say that I am aware of some businesses that use some hemp byproducts like hemp oil uh, but the difficulty is acquiring a large enough uh, portion of that in whichever state you may operate uh, to be uh, legal under their legislation. So it, it's a real dicey area. Uh, there's some time that it needs to settle out and see what happens in the farm bill and uh, with industrial hemp. I assume the question was about industrial hemp. Yeah, I would think so. All right. Sativa. Thank you, uh, HL. I've got another one that came in, and I'll just read this one out loud. Thank you for the webinar today. I was wondering, with a lot of these communities with little access to resources to get them started, 
What are some suggestions on getting them started? What are some steps in helping them find loans, grants, equipment, livestock, et cetera? Well, uh, because many of the populations, uh, well, all the populations where the, you're operating uh, are in uh, native and tribal populations, there are uh, some native lenders that are available and uh, native owned banks. I would say probably if you're working with young people uh, or beginning farmers, you could have uh, an opportunity to uh, approach for small loans. Uh, I think a, a, uh, a type of organization, and I, I use that, not, that term not in uh, uh, the sense of a structure, but in, in, in sense of getting people to work together in an organization where there could be a lot of uh, uh, helping of a group and pooling of resources and skills would be very important. Uh, many times in, in several uh, tribes that I've worked with in the past uh, have the very laudable goal of assisting elders and younger uh, children and people who are uh, under-resourced by providing food products, but they don't think about uh, making enough profit to stay in business. So I would say being very careful in the selection of your products that you uh, try to grow, try to develop a local market that is not just dependent upon something like a farmer's market. Uh, but you know, get a get a reasonable amount of product so you could sell it maybe to a retail store uh, versus a farmer's market would be another way to do this. It's going to be uh, it's going to require a lot of creativity, and it's going to require I think identifying things that uh, find the intersection of uh, the possible in terms of. Uh, natural resources and market opportunities, uh, the probable in terms of what may most logically work, and then the passionate, which is what do people really feel passionate about? And uh, if you can find that uh, the sweet spot of where those three things overlap, I think you'll find success and uh, you'll be able to get the resources that are needed. All right, thank you, HL. That uh, everything that you just described, it sounds like you're talking about scaling up an operation, and uh, yeah. I would I would think that uh, the basis of that would certainly be a business plan, and so that's exactly right. I would think that uh, any type of operation that's looking to get started, even even if there is a scarcity of resources, you really do need to start with a business plan because that's going to help you pick it apart, do an analysis and come up with something that's going to be viable over the long term and then be able to sell that vision to a lender or uh, some other source of uh, financing. I think that's an absolutely correct assessment, Brian. All right, then uh, I don't see any other questions uh, that have come in. Uh, HL, do you have a closing thought for uh, today's webinar? Well, I do not, but uh, well, I do, but it's it's more of a kind of a global uh, thing, it, uh, kind of a philosophy that I have of life. We must not grow weary in well doing, and uh, many times it seems like we're pushing a rope up a hill. The uh, easiest thing to do is become frustrated and discouraged, but I just encourage you to uh, stay the course and continue to, to follow uh, your heart and uh, follow the passion that you have for this effort. Uh, ramp up your skills, uh, be creative, and be long-suffering, and I think uh, a lot of good is going to come out of this, so I, I just want to be an encourager to you. Fantastic. And with that, uh, we will go ahead and close out today's webinar. Uh, and I'll just remind everyone that I did send an email this morning that will that has a registration link for our webinar that's coming up on Monday. 
which will be the second part of our food sovereignty assessment uh, webinar. So uh, definitely uh, check on that and get registered for that webinar. Again, I want to thank uh, HL for the presentation uh, and wish him all the best in his retirement. Um, and with that, uh, I'll say goodbye. Thank you, Brian. All right, thank you.